the Dragon's Triangle, considered by many to be one of the most mysterious places on Earth. And this is more of a speculative talk than a lot I give. Uh, uh, most of it is based on actual factual things that have happened, but a lot of the explanations for those factual things um, move into the realms of what we will call the speculative. Um, but I certainly hope you enjoy it. Uh, we will actually be sailing through the southwestern corner of the Dragon's Triangle over the next day or so during our approach to the Philippines. And of course, we're supposed to do so on our return voyage as well. Um, just to give you a heads up before we get too much further into this presentation, uh, I am going to be giving uh, another presentation tomorrow morning, sometime relatively early, I assume, uh, before we get to the Philippines. So I'm going to be doing a, a talk um, on a maritime history of the Philippines before we reach Manila. So I don't know what time that's going to be. I won't know until I look in the schedule tonight, like the rest of y'all. Uh, but that is almost certainly something I'll be doing tomorrow, probably around 9 or 10. So keep an eye out for that. That'll be ahead of our arrival in Manila. And if you haven't signed up for your excursions in Manila yet, I certainly recommend that you do. Uh, it's a big, hectic, bustling city. We are going to have uh, an overnight there. But if it's a place that you've never been before, uh, certainly, you know, having a, a bit of structure to what you're going to be doing during the day helps a lot, uh, as, as I have found. And I'm doing a couple of good ones tomorrow as well. Uh, well, a good one tomorrow and then a good one the day after. So hopefully I will see some of you on one of those excursions and have the opportunity to chat with you more. <clears throat> and I'm approachable. If uh, anyone would like to meet for a drink at Cellar Masters, my wife and I usually show up uh, there between five and six and have a glass of wine before going into dinner. So certainly we're uh, up to talk about any of the things I've been lecturing on or anything else uh, uh, at that time. All right, the Dragon's Triangle is a big place. We're only going to ha be able to explore a little bit of it. So let's jump right into it. And if we have some time, once we get done with the structured part of the presentation, I'll take some questions uh, at the end and answer them to the best of my ability. Uh, you're also welcome to stay in touch with me through uh, my travel blog or via email, and I'm the only Michael O. Varhola on Facebook, and I'll have all my contact information on the last slide at the end of this presentation. The Dragon's Triangle, also frequently known as the Devil's Sea and the Formosa or Taiwan, Taiwan Triangle, and even the Bermuda Triangle of the Pacific, is a legendary area in the Western Pacific Ocean that has been the location of many vanished surface vessels, aircraft, and people. Mariner's tales associated with the triangle extend back in time many centuries and include accounts of bright lights, volatile and southern, sudden weather changes, unexplained sudden ocean swells, whirlpools, thick fogs, violent storms, malfunctions of navigation and electronic equipment, and even crewless, such things as crewless ghost ships, unidentified submarine objects, or USOs, yes, that is a thing, and lapses in time. This area takes its most common name from Chinese legends dating back at least 3,000 years that describe dragons living in underwater homes in this area of the ocean presumably inspired by the smoke, steam, tremors, and other signs of volcanic and seismic activity periodically witnessed here. In Japan, on the other hand, uh, the area is known as Manuumi, the Devil's Sea. Many of the disappearances and other phenomena associated with the Dragon's Triangle involve a level of mystery that has been popularly explained by a variety of theories which go beyond mere human error or acts of nature attributed to wrecks and disappearances in other parts of the world. Such explanations have, in fact, um, increasingly, often, involved the paranormal, a suspension of the laws of physics, and even activity by extraterrestrial beings. All right. The traditional area of the Dragon's Triangle, as you can see here, uh, has its northern point at Japan's Miyake Island, about 60 miles south of Tokyo. 
its western point at the main Philippine island of Luzon, and its eastern point on the island of Guam. Uh, its area encompasses, among other things, much of the Philippine Sea and Japan's Izu Islands. Keep in mind, however, that the Triangle is a legendary area, or even a paranormal area, not a political one. Uh, that it does not appear on official maps, uh, and that its specific boundaries can vary widely with whoever's talking about it. Some writers, for example, place the southwestern corner uh, at Taiwan rather than Luzon, and there are many other variations uh, of those sorts. So if you're looking uh, uh, for more information about the Dragon's Triangle, you might find a completely different shape than what I'm showing here. Sometimes it's smaller, sometimes it's bigger, sometimes uh, one of its legs uh, is at a different point. This area is in any event, um, it does in any event, uh, encompass some of the most heavily traveled shipping lanes in the world, with ships crossing through it daily, bound for ports in Asia and the Americas, and cruise ships, like this one, are also plentiful. It is also a heavily flown area for commercial and private aircraft. I think it bears mentioning that the Dragon's Triangle uh, is only one of many areas around the world, both land and sea-based, that have acquired a similar reputation for strange phenomena and lost vessels. These include the Burl Triangle in southern France, the Bridgewater Triangle in southeastern Massachusetts, and several in the Great Lakes of North America, including the Marysburg Vortex, an area in eastern Lake Ontario, the Sophiasburg Triangle, also in Lake Ontario, and the Lake Erie Quadrangle in the lake of the same name. Uh, and I hadn't known about any of those. I was working on a book about shipwrecks in the Great Lakes several years ago, about 10 years ago, and I started coming across all of these areas uh, that had all sorts of weird phenomena associated with them, like the Bermuda Triangle, uh, but they were in the various Great Lakes. So you're getting areas like this in areas in locations throughout the world. The two biggest such legendary areas are the Bermuda Triangle and the Dragon's Triangle. <clears throat> and the most famous of such areas, of course, is the Bermuda Triangle, certainly the most famous to those of us who live in the Western Hemisphere, located in the Western Atlantic Ocean with points at Bermuda, Miami, and Puerto Rico. And it is, quite interestingly, and perhaps even significantly, located almost exactly on the other side of the globe from the Dragon's Triangle and on the same latitude. So I don't know in what way that might be significant, but certainly it seems to be more than a coincidence. All right, let's take a look at some of the, a few of the many, many incidents and legends that have been associated with the Dragon's Triangle. Against the advice of his Chinese advisors, Kublai Khan, the Mongol Emperor of China, made two attempts to take over Japan in the 13th century. But both attempts failed and are attributed by some to the effects of the Dragon's Triangle. The most popular explanation for these failed attempts is, in fact, widely attributed to supernatural causes, namely a divine wind, or kamikaze, which rose up to protect the Japanese people by wrecking the invading fleets. Uh, and if you have any questions about uh, Kublai Khan, I'm only going to touch briefly on it. Be sure to come uh, to my colleague Francis O'Donnell's talk at 345. Uh, he, of course, specializes in Marco Polo, who was exploring uh, the Far East during the era of Kublai Khan. And if you do come to his talk and you want more information, feel free to ask him about uh, the uh, Devil's Triangle or the uh, Dragon's Triangle and see what he says. Um, any number of theories about exactly why these attempted invasions failed have been offered over the years, many tying in with bad weather uh, or the construction of the Mongol vessels themselves. But a shroud of mystery and uncertainty still hangs over these lost invasion fleets. Kublai Khan's first attempt took place in AD 1274 with a fleet of 900 ships and 40,000 troops all or most of which were ultimately lost in the waters of the Dragon's Triangle. Kublai Khan launched his second invasion in 1281, and this time hedged his bets by sending two separate forces, one of 900 ships, 
containing 40,000 Korean, Chinese, and Mongol troops from Masan in what is now South Korea, and 3,500 ships carrying a force of 100,000 men from southern China. So these are huge invasion forces. Uh, you know, these compare uh, very favorably with uh, modern uh, uh, maritime uh, uh, assault forces. The first segment of the fleet easily took over. This is the, the first segment being the one that left from Korea um, and was crossing the Tsushima Straits. Uh, the first segment of the fleet easily took over Tsushima Island, about halfway across the strait, separating the Korean Peninsula from Japan, and then Iki Island, closer to the Japanese island of Kyushu. When the Korean fleet landed at Hakata Bay on Kyushu on June 23, 1281, however, the ships from China were nowhere to be seen and, in fact, never materialized, dooming the invasion. Wreckage of that fleet was, however, discovered several years ago off the coast of the main Japanese island of Honshu and has since, or has since it disappeared, uh, been in some minds uh, associated with the phenomena of the Dragon's Triangle. So certainly the biggest loss of ships and life uh, associated with the legends of the Triangle date to the era of Kublai Khan in the 13th century. <clears throat> so here we get into something uh, even a little weirder in a lot of ways, though it doesn't involve a lot of loss of life, but it's certainly strange. And really... Um, is fodder for mount, uh, modern UFOologists and uh, other paranormal uh, researchers. <clears throat> in 1803, the now famous Utsuro Bune legend arose in Japan and has been associated with the waters of the Dragon's Triangle. According to both legend and accounts published in at least three historic Japanese texts between 1825 and 1844, illustrations from which we can see here, from two different books, an attractive young woman arrived aboard a hollow ship on a beach in the Hitachi province on the eastern coast of Japan. Fishermen brought her inland to investigate further, but the woman was unable to communicate in Japanese, and eventually they returned her and her vessel to the sea where it drifted away. Uh, a number of scholars have dismissed the legend of the hollow boat as merely a trope of Japanese folklore, although that does not seem to take into account many of the specific details associated with the story. Certain paranormal investigators and UFO researchers, on the other hand, have interpreted the details of the legend as evidence of some sort of alien contact. And you could well see how they would, would draw that conclusion if they were so inclined to draw it uh, from the illustrations that appeared in those Japanese texts. Uh, whatever the case, the incident remains shrouded in mystery and associated with the Devil's Sea. Probably the most extensive public exposition of occurrences in the Dragon's Triangle was researched and written by author Charles Berlitz, who in 1989 had a book published on the subject. And he's also well known as the author of uh, a number of books on the Bermuda Triangle uh, and similar uh, uh, paranormal uh, 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 areas or effects uh, throughout the world. In it, Berlitz reports that from 1952 to 1954 alone, so just a two-year period, five Japanese military vessels were lost in the Triangle. You know, so this is uh, the years after the war. This isn't during a time of conflict, uh, along with more than 700 personnel. As a result, Berlitz says, the Japanese government labeled the area a danger zone and then funded a team of scientists to study the Devil's Sea. When their vessel disappeared, however, he says, Japan aborted the study. Uh, we do, in fact, now have a pretty good idea of what caused the disappearance of that research vessel, the Kayo Maru No. 5, and we'll look a little further along, uh, look at it a little further along when we examine explanations for disappearances in the area. Uh, Berlitz also describes the disappearances of numerous other vessels in the area, ranging from small fishing boats to tankers, and including American and Japanese warships and airplanes and even Soviet nuclear missile submarines, one of which we can see here, few of which left behind any signs of wreckage, such as oil slicks or flotsam. 
Berlitz also associated the Dragon's Triangle with the disappearance of American aviator Amelia Earhart, uh, who disappeared somewhere over the Pacific in 1937 in her Lockheed Electra 10E, which we can see here. Though, you know, every several years a new theory about Amelia Earhart uh, comes out. So uh, I wonder if he might not have just co-opted her because of uh, name recognition. That's not to say he might not be right. <clears throat> All right. We're now going to take a look at some of the things that have been used to explain the various incidents associated with the Dragon's Triangle, especially disappearances of vessels. So we have things like the weird uh, Utsuro Bune legend, uh, which is, is just sort of a, 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 a weird story of something that happened uh, in the Devil's Sea. But really, uh, the thing that makes it ominous, the area ominous, is the same thing that makes the Bermuda Triangle ominous, uh, the fact that many, many ships and people and aircraft have disappeared in it. Uh, so that is the, the major concern for most people, uh, certainly anyone sailing through it, as well it should be. <clears throat> the reputation of the Triangle itself has, unfortunately, become one of the obstacles to determining what has really happened with regard to any particular incident and the area has become the subject of many embellishments and urban legends. So, you know, uh, for people who are very, very rational, they'll say, oh, well, you know, now that you've uh, invoked uh, the phrase Dragon's Triangle or Bermuda's Triangle or any other such uh, legendary area, uh, you know, there's nothing to discuss because uh, this, is, this is all just uh, the realm of legend. But legends exist for reasons in many cases, uh, and the fact that an area acquires a legendary reputation doesn't mean that there aren't often uh, very real things that have happened there, uh, and possibly, as we're going to see, some uh, rational explanations for why those things uh, have happened. Uh, we're thus going to begin with, a, with some of the more verifiable or refutable possibilities for disappearances uh, in the Devil's Triangle, Dragon's Triangle rather, and work our way through to those that are somewhat more fantastic. For as long as anyone can remember, powerful volcanic activity has been associated with the Dragon's Triangle, and its effects are known to have led to the destruction, known to have led to the destruction, um, of some vessels and may have caused that uh, of any number of others. So th this uh, is a very compelling theory because we know for a fact, historically, any number of vessels have been destroyed in the Dragon's Triangle because of seismic activity and, and volcanic eruptions. Um, so this is something that we can certainly uh, extrapolate upon. One of the most dramatic episodes of this sort took place from 1952 to 53, when the Myosian Show underwater volcano erupted so violently that it caused the repetitions, appearance, and disappearance of an island. At one point, the island reached a height of about 35 feet above sea level before once again sinking beneath the waves. So from 1952 to 53, there's so much volcanic activity in this area that, that an island actually keeps rising up above the waves and sinking down underneath it. There's that much tumultuousness going on uh, uh, on, on the seafloor. Um, one of the most famous incidents of modern times associated with the Dragon's Triangle uh, involves the aforementioned Kayo Maru No. 5, a Japanese venture vessel launched in 1942 as one of a class of Japanese government marine research ships designed to gather information about things like weather and currents in potential naval, naval battlefields. So it was a Japanese government research vessel, but the purpose of its research was to sail around the world, uh, or the purpose of, of the vessels were to sail around different areas around the world and gather intelligence about conditions so that the Japanese Navy would have uh, actionable information in the event that it ever fought a, a war there or fought a battle there. Uh, so civil vessels that had uh, a uh, military theme to their mission. Uh, unlike many of its sister ships, the Kayo Maru No. 5 uh, survived World War II and continued to serve as a research vessel in the years following it. On September 24, 1952, however, it abruptly disappeared within the Dragon's Triangle with the loss of all 31 of its crew members and is believed to have been sunk by jets of water and airborne fragments 
ejected by the eruption of the Myosian uh, Show submarine volcano. Numerous other vessels, most of them fishing boats, have been lost in the same general area in the years before and since, and while precisely what happened to them remains unknown, some of them might certainly have suffered the same fate as the Kaiomaru No. 5 and been destroyed by uh, volcanic eruptions or seismic activity. And we're looking at, uh, at the left uh, at an image of that research vessel uh, sometime in the early 50s before it disappeared, obviously. And at the right, um, what I consider to be kind of a frustrating picture, we're looking at a picture of uh, an eruption of this submarine volcano. That actually is a, a real picture of the eruption, but there's nothing in it to give any sense of scale. So I don't know if uh, what we're looking at there is uh, the structure that rose 35 feet above sea level, uh, or if we're just looking at something that's you know three feet above sea level. So I, I, I'm still researching that out uh, and trying to, to find out more about it. But that was all a real thing in any event. <clears throat> All right, moving on to a different type of uh, geological phenomena, and one that is associated with the Bermuda Triangle as well, uh, is a popular, if somewhat radical, naturalistic explanation for some of the disappearances in the dra Dragon's Triangle, which focus on the presence of vast fields of chemical compounds called methane hydrates that are present on the continental shelves. And we can see here, uh, places with the little yellow uh, five-sided shapes there uh, that methane hydrate fields are known to occur. And you'll note one is right off the coast of Florida, smack dab uh, in the location of the Bermuda's Triangle, Bermuda Triangle, and the other is just south of Japan uh, where the Dragon's Triangle is located. Um, <clears throat> significant quantities of these crystalline deposits, methane hydrates, have been detected by a number, uh, at a number of locations around the world to include the Dragon's Triangle. Uh, methane hydrate eruptions occur when pieces of these compounds break off and rise to the surface, dissolving, as they do, and forming huge areas of frothy water that are no longer, no longer capable of providing adequate buoyancy for ships and might cause them to sink very rapidly and without warning. And laboratory experiments uh, have, in fact, been shown that methane hydrate bubbles can indeed sink a scale model ship by decreasing the density of the water. So uh, I couldn't get video to run in connection with this, uh, but there are a couple of videos that are available uh, based on experiments done in, you know, like pools where methane hydrates were released uh, and the bubbles will rise up. Uh, they'll uh, change the density of the water and a scale model ship, you know, something three or four feet long, will just plummet beneath uh, the surface of the water. So if, if you're interested in following up on that, it's easy to find uh, some pretty cool video tying in with that. Um, it is quite possible uh, for little, uh, if any, debris to be left by such a rapid sinking, and any pieces from a vessel wrecked in this way that subsequently did rise to the surface uh, would likely be uh, dispersed by prevailing currents anyway. Uh, so methane hydrate uh, deposits throughout the world are something that certainly could uh, account for uh, disappearances in uh, the Dragon's Triangle and similar areas. <clears throat> All right, this is, this is one of my favorite naturalistic explanations uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, another explanation for losses in the Dragon's Triangle involves rogue waves, large, unexpected, and suddenly appearing surface waves that can be extremely dangerous, even to large ships. Not cruise ships, but other large ships. Rogue waves present considerable danger for reasons that include them being rare, unpredictable, appearing suddenly or without warning, and striking with tremendous force. Once considered mythical and lacking hard evidence for their existence, rogue waves are now proven to exist and known to be a natural oceanic, oceanic phenomenon. Eyewitness accounts from mariners and damage inflicted on ships have long suggested that rogue waves occurred, but the first scientific evidence of the existence of rogue waves 
was not recorded. This is amazing to me. Was not recorded until 1984 or widely accepted until 1995. So for centuries, uh, people at sea have been saying uh, our cargo vessel was overturned by a rogue wave or it was slammed uh, by a rogue wave, and that's why all the Connex containers washed off the deck. Uh, but um, uh, the administrators at shipping companies or insurance companies uh, or uh, government uh, agencies doing inquests have said, Oh, well, you said rogue wave, and uh, that's code for incompetence. Uh, there's some sort of human error. There's some sort of fault here. You screwed up somewhere because there's no, no such thing as rogue waves. So really, literally, for centuries, people who were at sea who were being affected by rogue waves, which doesn't happen very often. You know, uh, most sailors never seen one in their whole lifetime. But when these things were, were reported, they were just dismissed as, as fantasies or uh, you know, a code for, I screwed up. Uh, but now we know uh, and have evidence that these are real things uh, that are formed by wave patterns that just sort of form a perfect storm, as it were, and then create a wave that's not necessarily uh, 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 the largest of waves, but very powerful and uh, running uh, 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 against the prevailing waves, and thus the, very hard for, uh, for ships to, to respond to. Um, so it's a real thing, and uh, the devil's or the dragon's triangle has been uh, postulated to be an area because of the various currents uh, and effects there, where rogue waves are quite possibly more common than in other areas. But you know, we've only acknowledged the existence of these things for a couple of decades now, uh, so there's a lot more research to be done before we can say for sure that this is something that's widely associated with the dragon's triangle. But it sure could be. Compass problems are also cited in many Dragon's Triangle incidents. The direction in which a compass needle points, and any former military people here are going to, how many former military people do we have here? Navy, Army, Air Force, a few, okay. Well, people who, uh, who are former military or have read a lot about these things um, know that the direction in which a compass needle points is known as magnetic north, uh, which is not actually toward the North Pole, but toward the north end of the Earth's magnetic field, okay? North magnetic pole also wanders slightly over the years. It shifts, it doesn't stay in one place. So the, the uh, direction a compass points is not toward the North Pole. It doesn't point toward the geographic uh, northern top of the world. It points to a spot uh, that's somewhat deviated from that uh, that moves. And one of the first things I learned when I was a soldier in learning how to use a map uh, was that you have something on a map called a declination diagram, which shows uh, how much deviation there is from true north at any spot uh, in the world. And you've got to take that into account when you're doing a compass reading. Uh, some places it varies more than others. Well, it varies quite a bit, uh, as a matter of fact, in um, the Dragon's Triangle. So this is something, you know, obviously that most professional mariners are not going to fall prey to, one would hope, uh, but uh, it's a factor. It's a factor that has to be taken into consideration. So it's certainly possible uh, that some of the people who have disappeared in the Dragon's Triangle did not take these factors into account, operated according to faulty readings, and quickly became lost as a, re as a result. And certainly, uh, we've got to keep in mind, uh, certainly we've all had a good experience, I hope, in all of the places we have visited so far on this cruise. Uh, we'll have a good experience in all the places that uh, we will visit on the rest of it. But certainly, uh, a number of the countries that we've been to or, or will go to or exist in this area aren't necessarily going to be welcoming to someone who uh, is off course and accidentally lands in their country and has uh, flaky explanations for why they're there, but no 10-year uh, visas in their passport. Uh, so uh, certainly, just getting lost and landing in the wrong place in any of the countries around the Dragon's Triangle could uh, create a certain amount of peril. One of the most cited explanations in official inquiries as to the loss of any aircraft or vessel in any area, to include the Dragon's Triangle, is human error. And in many cases, as we just explored with uh, the subject of rogue waves, uh, human error is often attributed even to naturalistic phenomena. 
Whether deliberate or accidental, humans have been known to make mistakes, uh, resulting in catastrophe, and losses within the dragon's triangle are no exception to that. Deliberate acts of destruction, including war and acts of piracy, have also been used to explain some of the mysteries of the Dragon's Triangle. Records and declassified military files from various combat, combatant nations, uh, for example, have been checked for losses, and many sinkings have been attributed to surface raiders or submarines during the World Wars and documented in the various uh, command logbooks. So, for example, a transport vessel in World War II might have disappeared uh, in any given area of the world to include uh, the Dragon's Triangle. I, nobody will know why that cargo vessel or transport vessel uh, disappeared. There won't be any official record of it that anybody knows of, but then it'll come out after the war that a German commerce raider might have been active in that area uh, in the early 1940s and uh, sunk uh, such and such a vessel. So until after a war is over and uh, classified files are released, uh, this sort of thing is not necessarily known. And piracy, an act which continues to this day in seas and oceans worldwide, has also been blamed for some incidents in the Dragon's Triangle. All right, I love this graphic. This is not a graphic of my own creation. But it just, it just was too good to pass up using. <clears throat> Stand by. There are also a number of popular but largely unsubstantiated theories used to explain, after a fashion, the mysteries of the Dragon's Triangle. And you can find all sorts of uh, documentary style shows on ch channels, cable channels that used to have uh, words like science in their title, used to mostly be straight science, but now you can find an awful lot of things on the Science Channel or Smithsonian Channel, National Geographic Channel, History Channel, that explore this sort of thing uh, to some extent. Uh, if you're ever watching television with my wife in the middle of the night, you will certainly be watching a show of this sort. Uh, she doesn't watch anything that doesn't have to do with uh, UFOs, Nazis, or paranormal phenomena in the middle of the night. So I end up watching a lot of these just sort of peripherally. Um, but one of the things that makes these series fun and compelling uh, is that they cannot be disproved. Well, disprove that, that this such and such a thing happened, that aliens are responsible uh, for the disappearances in the Dragon's Triangle. But by their very nature, uh, such explanations cannot be proved either. Um, so, while it, so they're not really scientifically credible in a lot of ways. Uh, so while it's certainly possible that paranormal or supernatural or uh, UFO-based explanations might be true, the probability is against this being the case. But they're still fun, and they tie in with the whole um, uh, aura of the Dragon's Triangle, so we're going to look at some of them. Um, some authors, uh, in fact, uh, including the aforementioned Charles Berlitz, have even gone so far as to simply and somewhat lazily, I think, attribute the mysteries of the Dragon's Triangle to unknown forces or what he has dismissed as anomalous phenomena. Well, this isn't very satisfying. You know, even if you're, you're writing sort of a, a conspiracy theory crank book on something, you got to come up with a better explanation than, well, you know, it just might be anomalous phenomena. So, let's look at some of our anomalous phenomena, or at least things that are considered kind of strange. Uh, submerged stone structures. Uh, and, of course, this is a real thing now, but it ties in with Atlantis-like legends, so that's why we're uh, grouping it here. Uh, submerged stone structures lying just below the waters off the Japanese island of Yonaguni are, according to credible sources that include marine geologists, the ruins of a Japanese Atlantis that was founded some 5,000 years ago and sunk by an earthquake about 2,000 years ago. The largest of the structures, and some of you might have seen pictures of this uh, on the news or documentaries, the largest of the structures discovered in this area looks like a complicated monolithic stepped pyramid that rises to a striking height of 82 feet. 
So the biggest structure associated with this uh, submerged city is an 82-foot high stepped pyramid. Um, and just Google uh, Japanese Atlantis, uh, and, and some of these pictures will pop right up. Other submarine remains have also been found within the region of the Dragon's Triangle and tied in with its legends, including suggestions that they were destroyed by forces active within the area or that lost ancient technology has contributed to the effects active in that area. And you get this with the Bermuda Triangle as well. The whole idea that, uh, uh, you know, when Edgar Cayce, uh, the American mystic, uh, predicted that Atlantis would be discovered in the Bahamas in, I think, 1968, and then what we know now is the Bimini Road, which is a submarine structure that was found off the coast of the Bahamas in 1968, uh, that confirmed to a lot of people that Atlantis was a real thing and that really did exist uh, in the Bahamas. Uh, it's, we're looking at the same sort of thing uh, with these Japanese Atlantis ruins uh, off the coast of Japan. <clears throat> UFOs are perhaps predictably another popular explanation for disappearances in the Dragon's Triangle. Some paranormal theorists claim extraterrestrials are the reason for disappearances and that they have abducted ships, aircraft, and people. Um, a number of ufologists have, in fact, postulated that the legendary Yellow Emperor of China, who is said to have descended from heaven in a hollow metal dragon, was in fact a visitor from another planet. A number of such theories have incorporated the legends of the Dragon's Triangle and claimed that it is the site of one or more ancient underwater alien bases. You can Google that too. Uh, and and a, a surprising amount uh, will pop up if you get Google underwater alien base Japan. A lot of stuff pops up. So there, there certainly are a number of people who, who earnestly um, uh, are exploring these possibilities. And then time warp and uh, similar other things are, are also uh, used to explain, as I said, after fashion, some of the things that have occurred in the triangle. <laughs> so, as you can see, while there is a substantial mystery associated with the Dragon's Triangle, there are no shortages of explanations for those mysteries or debates about their veracity. And a combination of these many explanations could and probably does account for many of the disappearances of ships and planes in the area of the Devil Sea. For example, uh, if any given area is known for uh, a higher than usual rate of disappearances, and you have just slightly more underwater volcanic activity combined with slightly more releases of methane hydrate uh, compounds, then you're going to have uh, commensurately more disappearances and an area is going to get uh, a reputation uh, for being especially ominous or dangerous. So really, really, uh, you could have an area like the Devil's Sea where you do have an inordinate number of disappearances, but just a syndrome uh, a combination of naturalistic or, you know, decreasingly naturalistic, increasingly paranormal explanations. Just, just, just slight variations in the norm could end up over the years uh, contributing to many, many more losses of ships than would be usual somewhere else. Uh, so it doesn't even have to be something really dramatic or profound uh, that's happening on a regular basis. All right. Uh, we should have a few minutes for questions and answers. Uh, if I don't know the answer to any of your questions, I will try to find answers to them. Uh, and you should feel free to talk to me at any point on the cruise, as noted before, or to contact me through my various blogs or via email, uh, the addresses for which are shown here. And as mentioned, I'm the only Michael Overhola on uh, Facebook. Uh, I'll be the one that has all the cool pictures from Vietnam and Hong Kong on his page. So, all right. Do we have any questions? I never know whether it's a good sign or a bad sign when we don't. Yes, sir. Always triangles. Why isn't there a devil's rectangle or some other shape? Sometimes there is. Uh, in Lake Erie, for example, there is a legendary area of the sort that we're describing called uh, the Lake Erie Quadrangle. So sometimes, sometimes there, there is such uh, a different shape, a variation on the shape. But they are mostly triangles. Why? 
I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, I, I, probably, I mean, I could answer that question in any number of ways. Uh, I could try to come up with, with something, uh, with some sort of a mystical or supernatural basis, but I would say that it's more likely that the area is not shaped like a triangle at all. Uh, if there is such an area that it has a completely irregular shape that is, is sort of indeterminate, uh, and it just happens to fall within an area that can be marked off by three points. That would be my guess. That's why they're triangles, because it's easy to find three points and draw lines. Uh, so it's probably, probably is more like a, you know, a swirling shape or a blob or a circle. or It probably doesn't have any straight lines on it in any event would be my guess. So, so uh, why a triangle? Because we can pick three places. And the human mind does gravitate uh, to threes. Uh, so, you know, th th that, if anything, is, is, is you know, uh, a good psychological explanation for why it's a triangle, because it has three points. Uh, but my guess would be that, in fact, these areas, if they do exist, to the extent to which they exist, aren't really triangles at all, and we just express them as triangles because that's something we can get our minds around. Yes, sir. Have I ever experienced a rogue wave? No, I have not experienced a, a rogue wave. I have not. Um, uh, you know, I've spent quite a bit of time at, at, at sea over the years, uh, but that is not something that I've experienced uh, yet. Now, you've spent a lot of time at sea. Have you experienced a rogue wave? You have? Okay. So, so you can verify this is a real thing. Uh, was, it, was it terrifying? All right. And what was the effect upon the ship of getting hit with rogue wave? Good lord. Really? Wow. So, th so they pretty openly acknowledged uh, that that's what it was and what had happened. And was there, was there any uh, damage to the ship? Did it uh, take any damage from, from being hit? <laughs> well, that, that is pretty amazing. Uh, thank, you, thank you for sharing that. It's kind of cool that when we talk about some of this stuff, uh, if somebody you know, has, ac has actually seen it themselves. So, so thank you. Yes, sir. What's that? Yes, sir? Wow, okay. All right, interesting. No, uh, but I have not experienced that myself yet, but, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to keep on sailing, so uh, it's, it's only a matter of time, right? So, and then I'll go rushing out with my camera and try to get a picture of uh, the cattywampus ship with the... Uh, with the <laughs> <laughs> the propeller up in the air. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, both of you. Uh, yes, sir. Right. Uh, when did the first Poseidon Adventure come out? 73, I think, right? Well, I, uh, I, think, I think that's when the, the movie Poseidon Adventure came out. But you know what? Uh, I, I'm going to get a counseling session from the cruise director if I'm talking about capsized cruise ships during my, my lecture. I'm just, gl I'm just glad that they're not recording anymore once we go into the Q&A, so maybe no one will ever know that we've been, we've been discussing this. But yeah, that was 73. So that was before the era of, uh, uh, of the first recorded rogue wave. That first recorded rogue wave uh, that, that you know, is acknowledged as the first one that was recognized as a rogue wave. That wasn't until 84, and that was well more than a decade after uh, Poseidon Adventure. So, so you know, uh, you know as, as you're sort of alluding, this is something that was acknowledged. This is something that people just knew about. Uh, it was, was, you know, right on the cusp of legend, but so many people had experienced these things, 
yet somehow um, officialdom didn't recognize it as a real thing, which I think is, uh, is really kind of strange. All right. Um, Oh, okay, and I have heard that as well. Yeah, I have heard that as well. Okay, uh, I can't take any more questions right now because they told me that uh, when I hit my point, I have to get out of here because someone else is coming. They were real unequivocal about that. But um, I will go up to the top of the stairs outside of this room, and I'm glad to uh, chat a little bit more uh, uh, about this stuff. So just give me a minute to uh, gather up my crap, and I'm going to head out of here. I hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, thank you so much for coming.